The fighting has intensified in Gaza after the temporary ceasefire ended. That's right. The fragile pause lasted just seven days. Israel carried out airstrikes almost immediately, saying it hit around 200 targets. Israeli officials are accusing Hamas of violating the terms of the deal by firing rockets towards Israel territory. The immediate response is no surprise, though. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has repeatedly vowed to crush Hamas once the ceasefire ended. During the week-long reprieve, Hamas released 80 hostages. In exchange, Israel released 240 Palestinian prisoners. 24 foreign nationals were also released. The Biden administration is urging Israel to be meticulous with its offensive moving forward in an effort to minimize civilian casualties. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says he will continue to fight for the release of more hostages, but ultimately Hamas is to blame for the ceasefire ending. It came to an end because of Hamas. Hamas reneged on commitments it made. In fact, even before the pause came to an end, it committed an atrocious terrorist attack in Jerusalem, killing three people, wounding others, including Americans. Uh, it began firing rockets before the pause had ended. And as I said, it reneged on the commitments it made in terms of releasing certain hostages. We remain intensely focused on getting everyone home, getting hostages back. It's something that I also work, uh, worked on today. So we're still at this. CBS News uh, foreign correspondent Lilia Luciano joins us now from Tel Aviv, Israel. So, Lilia, what are we seeing on the ground there now? Wow, so much has been happening throughout the day today. Uh, one UN official, Elaine, called it hell on earth, what has been unleashing in Gaza. According to the Gaza, to the Hamas run, we should say, Gaza Health Ministry, there are more than 100 people who have been killed today alone. We are our producer in Gaza, Marwan Al Ghul, uh, captured some just devastating video of destruction in a mosque. Um, talked to some young kids, and you know, one of the things that's very striking about the way the war is carried out is that you realize that the goals of this war, according to the government of Israel, which is to eradicate Hamas, um, are sometimes not met uh, or or are put placed further away. Uh, in the way that the war is carried out. And I say this because we heard from a, a teenager, a very young teen, talking about, you know, what, what we want is martyrdom. Uh, we're not afraid of you. May, may God or Allah, in, in his case, you know, unleash his, his power on you. So the way the war is carried out, with so much killing of civilians that have happened, according to the uh, Gaza Health, Health Ministry, up until now, not just now, today, but I mean before the truce, the sentiments are, are fueled uh, against Israel. And so the, the, the destruction, the devastation, according uh, to the IDF and to the Israeli government, it, they seek to minimize it by designated by designating some safe, quote unquote, safe areas, but some areas for civilians to go to. Uh, the way that was carried out today was sending people, evacuating people in Khan Yunis, which is in southern Gaza already, where you know thousands and thousands of people have evacuated from northern Gaza. 1.8 million, according to the UN, internally displaced people, most of them in the south, sending them even further towards the Rafah crossing uh, into Egypt, where, of course, people can't just get across. So the U.S., the Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has, of course, held Hamas responsible, has, of course, said that uh, Israel has every right to defend itself, but noting that the way Israel defends itself matters. Uh, so there is... The, the war began uh, quickly this morning. The hostage family members the, who still have so many people left behind are, you know, awaiting what's next. We do know that negotiations are ongoing. The fact that the truce, the seven-day truce ended doesn't mean that there can't be another one. So there is some hope there. Uh, but the war is, is raging on. And today, um, I heard, I, we interviewed, and we'll have the story on Evening News, a soldier, a female soldier, who is part of a unit that is in charge of surveilling the border. And she tells us about uh, having alerted her superior, officials from the IDF, about the dangers, uh, about patterns that had changed 
across the border at least six months before the October 7th attacks and that she felt, like many of her colleagues who are all female soldiers, that she wasn't listened, that she wasn't taken seriously. And she believes this all led to October 7th. She says, look, I'm not saying that it wouldn't have happened, but perhaps not as many people would have been killed in the atrocious way that they were here in Israel. We'll have that story uh, on the CBS Evening News tonight. Yeah, and Lilia, I mean, your point about that, that team shows how the intractable emotions that make peace so difficult. Mm -hmm. Our fellow midday anchor, Lilia Luciano, there for us. Thank you. And we are learning more about what Israel knew about Hamas's October 7th attack before it happened. The New York Times reports Israeli officials obtained a battle plan for the assault more than a year before it occurred. However, Israeli military and intelligence officials reportedly dismissed it as aspirational. They believed the plan was too difficult for Hamas to carry out. CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazas joins us now. Olivia, what does the reporting reveal about why Israeli officials just dismissed this plan? Sure. Well, it seems to boil down to a judgment that somebody, and it isn't spelled out exactly who, uh, may have made about Hamas's capability versus its intent to carry out this attack. And you would need both to pull it off. So the fact that there may have been this very detailed um, Jericho wall blueprint, as it was described by the Times, seems to clearly illustrate that Hamas's intent was there. Uh, but based on these interviews and documents that the Times says it reviewed, some number of senior military and intelligence officials judged that Hamas probably lacked the capability to carry out something on this scale, calling it, again, aspirational, as you said. There are some more nuanced considerations about whether Hamas, Hamas's senior leadership even wanted to do it, given there had been this effort to get Palestinians into Israel uh, for work. Um, and I would say, overall, this is a really important piece of reporting, but it's only part of the whole story that is still coming out in pieces. And it's not going to be until there is that comprehensive accounting of who knew what when, mm -hmm. ideally by, done by an impartial body, that will have that full picture and we'll have to see if Israel is going to muster the political will to do that after the heat of this immediate battle dies down. Uh, Olivia, as you know, I mean, there's still a lot of uh, unanswered questions right now. Do we have a sense, though, of how likely it is that, given the nature of this information, Israel shared it with U.S. agencies? It's a great question. I would say it's highly unlikely for two reasons. One is that the U.S. would just not have been focused on direct threats to Israeli territory and security. And that's both because of how the U.S. needs to apportion its own scarce intelligence resources and, frankly, because the Israelis probably wouldn't want us meddling in their backyard in the same way we wouldn't want their eyes and ears in our backyard. Uh, then there's this question of how far within its security apparatus this document and the supporting evidence actually circulated. If it was bogged down in the lower ranks, that makes it, you know, all that more unlikely that American analysts ever heard of it. But it's really that first point. And we've reported here before that the U.S. effectively stopped collecting anything on Hamas activities in Gaza uh, in any significant way after 9-11 because it needed to affect that huge shift of its counterterrorism efforts to focus on al-Qaeda. Um, that pendulum has swung back a little bit uh, in recent weeks, as we've learned that Americans were among the hostages being held uh, in Gaza. So our collection, principally in the form of signals intelligence, uh, has resumed. But otherwise, it had been squarely on the Israelis uh, to collect on Hamas-specific threats in, again, their backyard. Olivia, I want to follow up on a point that you were making, though, about potentially lower-level officials or higher-level officials. The IDF has taken responsibility for the intelligence failure. But are other members of the Israeli government potentially culpable for this specifically? What does this mean for Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, there are still a number of more chapters to come, I think, in the political fallout from this whole debacle. The, the Times piece actually doesn't answer the question of whether senior political officials, including Prime Minister Netanyahu, were ever shown this plan, how aware they were of it. You know, on the one hand, having detailed information for that long, for a year, might suggest that there was plenty of time to check it, to monitor it, to put resources in place to protect against it if it came to pass. On the other hand, you could see how some of the urgency surrounding a blueprint that doesn't come to fruition fades over time. It comes back to this incomplete picture we have of who knew what when uh, and uh, when political leadership actually became apprised. That's what we're still learning, waiting to learn. All right, Olivia Gazes. Olivia, thank you. Thank you.